Well, good evening, ladies and gentlemen, and I was hoping boys and girls, but I guess not. <laughs> Welcome to another exciting author event presented by Radnor Memorial Library and Radnor Historical Society. If you have attended any of one of our wonderful events, then you won't be surprised to find out we have decided to take our show on the road. For tonight, anyway. So here we are in the beautiful Radnor Middle School, and I would like to thank Anthony Stevenson, principal of the school and Radnor School District, of course, for the use of their school for our special event, an evening with the Eisenhowers. All library events are supported by the Friends of the Library, and raise your hand if you're a friend. I know I have a lot of friends here. Well, thank you all, because your hard work, your donations, gives me the budget to present evenings like this and then actually program all the programs at the library throughout the year. We're very thrilled to have David and Julie Eisenhower here with us tonight to talk about their book, Going Home to Glory, a memoir of Life with Dwight D. Eisenhower, 1961 to 1969. First, we'll begin with the Pledge of Allegiance, led by Marty Costello, commander of Bateman Gallagher American Legion Post, here in Wayne, and Steve Palantonio, President of the Radnor Memorial Library Board of Trustees, who will introduce our authors. Please welcome Marty and Steve. Come to 
to the Radnor uh, Memorial Library and speak. And I don't think I was expecting someone to mention the fact that David did a lot of research at this library for Going Home to Glory and for other works. He, we had, as was mentioned, we have three children, and when they were about 20 years ago, when they were small, um, he was escaping the house. He didn't have an office, and he wasn't at Penn yet, so he would come down to the Radnor Library for about five years every day and work down here. And I'm sure he can even tell you exactly what parts he research of the book he researched here. So we thank you uh, for this great library, and we want you to know that we are big supporters of the public library system. And when uh, Berwyn, uh, Berwyn's East Town Library had their uh, capital campaign to expand the building, we were honorary co-chairs and helped fundraise for that. And Berwyn's East Town Library is the heart and soul of, of that community. So we know the power of libraries, and I'm sure that the Radnor Memorial Library is really the heart and soul of, of your community as well. It was mentioned that uh, I helped Dave with going home to glory, and I have to say that in our 42 years together, I think it's the thing I've enjoyed doing the most. We really, it was fun to put the book together to help with it, and it's a great story because uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a great, a great person. And sitting in the audience, to tell you afterwards, if you can get him, if he doesn't leave, is Ike's caddy. Now, is this a small world right there? Ray, would you mind standing for just a second? Um, a front row seat to two presidencies, Eisenhower and Nixon. And so that gave us the opportunity to see the White House uh, as children, and then of course as adults. Now when I say that I knew the White House as a child, I don't want to you know, give any, any false information there because really I was a very sheltered child. My parents didn't, didn't involve us very much in politics. And you, I think you, uh, to, to the fact that I was sheltered uh, is evident in an encounter I had with uh, Jacqueline Kennedy in 1952. She was then Miss Bouvier, and she was the roving photographer for the Washington Times Herald, which has since gone out of business. And the, the Times Herald, the big news story of the day was that uh, Senator Nixon had been named by Dwight Eisenhower as his vice presidential running mate. So Jackie's editor sent her out to the Nixon house in the Washington suburbs. No secret service at that time, in fact, two, except uh, for my father during the daytime. So the house was unguarded. We lived on a, just a regular street, three-bedroom house. And uh, Jackie comes up to the house. And the only person she could come up with that day was me. I was four years old, playing in front of, of the house. And she took a picture of me. And the next morning, in the uh, Washington Times Herald was a a picture of me uh, with the caption, which had her question, what, and the question was, do you play with Democrats? And my response, being a little kid, was, what's a Democrat? And I'm still trying to figure it out. <laughs> <laughs> from David, who loves politics and history, and he loves his students at Penn. He's been there for 10 years, and I would uh, say that those students when they have Professor Eisenhower, they come to love the subjects as well because he just is so excited about our democracy and our political system. Now, I don't want, again, I don't want you to get the idea that, that since David and I knew each other as kids that if this was all just going to happen because it really was kind of a close run thing that we ended up together because we really only met when we were eight years old at the um, second Nixon Eisenhower, or I should say Eisenhower Nixon inauguration in 1957. And at that time, uh, I think I made quite an impression on David because uh, I was eight and, I, and he was eight, and I had a really dramatic black eye. Really, really neat. I mean, if you're a boy, you're going to really like this black eye. I had lost control of my sled. Washington had a wonderful snowstorm a few days before the inauguration. I went into a tree, I had this black eye. And when the, after the uh, inaugural swearing in, the parade started, and the photographers wanted a picture of President Eisenhower with his grandchildren and my father with Tricia and me. 
So the photographers all, you know, we were on the platform and the photographers were gathering down here, and getting ready to take the picture. And Ike leans down to me and he said, he whispered, now Julie, you look this way and they won't see your black eye. So I looked this way for the pictures. And of course, standing there was this very cute other eight-year-old, David. And um, a few, when we were engaged a decade later, President Eisenhower gave me a copy of that photo and he wrote to Julie Nixon, who even then, unknowingly, seems to have acquired an admirer. <laughs> but that was then, and then later, we wouldn't see each other for 10 years, a decade. And the only reason we ever got together again at that time was that Mamie Eisenhower found out that I was at Smith and David was at Amherst, they're seven miles apart. Amherst has only become co-ed in the last I don't know, 15 years or so, so it was all men, and Smith is still all women. And she absolutely hounded David for weeks. You've got to look up Julie Nixon. So finally, he did his duty call. He came over to call me at my dorm at Smith. And, uh, you know, he, we, he had one of these, these, these moments where he, uh, he almost didn't come back, because the first thing that happened that was bad was that he didn't have enough money to pay for the ice cream that we ordered. I had strawberry <laughs> and chocolate, but he had spent the money on the cab over, because freshmen weren't allowed to have cars. So I had to pick up the tab. And then uh, he came back a week later, I guess, to redeem himself. And he had the experience that almost completely derailed this romance. Uh, there was a young girl on duty at our, in my dorm, and all the young gentlemen callers had to announce themselves. And so David said to the young woman, Hello, um, I'm David Eisenhower, and uh, I would like to see Julie Nixon. And she gave him a long look and said, Yeah, and I'm Harry Trippett. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think either of us could have imagined back then, in 1966, that my father would embark on a political comeback and that uh, we would be in, experiencing the White House for a second time. And all I can tell you is that the view from inside the White House is quite different from the view outside. Tonight, uh, I won't, I'm, we're going to offer you a view of what it's like to be inside a post-presidency. That's really the theme of going home to glory. And the book is, you can really look at the book in three ways. First, it's a history of the 60s. Second, it's a story of a grandfather and a grandson, a very close relationship. And finally, it's really a study of power and how the most powerful man in the world on January 20th, 1961, Dwight D. Eisenhower, peacefully surrenders power to his successor, John F. Kennedy, and moves into retirement and becomes the unofficial advisor to his successors, to Kennedy, to Johnson, and then for a few months before President Eisenhower died, to my father, Richard Nixon. Um, Eisenhower was the first president affected by the 22nd Amendment, which prohibited, as you all know, presidents from running for a third term. And it's pretty clear from research and from other observations that Dwight Eisenhower would have won, run for a third term. One of my favorite little nuggets from the book, uh, Going Home to Glory, is how Eisenhower fielded a, a press conference question in early 1960, and that was the year that my father was running against John F. Kennedy. And Eisenhower was asked at his weekly press conference, doesn't that seem like an unusual today, with presidents giving press conferences once every two months, or three, or four, or five, but Eisenhower had a weekly press conference. And the question was, you know, Mr. President, you can't run for a third term, but can you, do you think you can run as, as vice president on the ticket this year? And Eisenhower was interested enough and intrigued enough by that question that he didn't, he said, I'll give you an answer next week. He had the Justice Department re research it, and guess what? He could have run as vice president. Now, of course, we all know that my father uh, selected Henry Cabot Lodge, but just Eisenhower's looking, have, looking into that, having the Justice Department look into it, shows that he was still engaged. See, presidents are very driven individuals. They all run for the office because they've become convinced that they are the only ones who can do the job. You know, they have this a vision. And stepping aside from the presidency is very difficult. In the 80s, Ronald Reagan was poised 
for a third term because uh, he had, there was a movement to repeal the 22nd Amendment. And the only reason he did not run for that third term is that Iran Contra intervened and the amendment, you know, died. And then I've been thinking a lot in the last few weeks about Bill Clinton. Now he's more popular today than he was when he left office. And if we didn't have the 22nd Amendment, don't you think Bill Clinton would be getting ready to run right now? So I mean, I think it's very interesting to look at these post-presidencies because these presidents, they still feel they have unfinished agendas. The presidential sweepstakes, it's upon us already. It's 13 months or 13 and a half months, but already we have all the cable and we can Twitter and you go to an event and somebody takes a picture of a candidate and gets a comment, a candid comment uh, with their cell phone. Uh, everywhere you turn, it's the race for the presidency. It's the most entertaining story to many Americans that's going on, even more entertaining for some than the great sports scene here. And there are several button issues right now that, uh, hot button issues that I think you'd be really startled to read the book Going Home to Glory and to see that 45 years ago, Eisenhower was talking about these exact same issues. For example, in 1966, I wrote to David it, when he was away at high school, in, in prep school and said, quote, too many of us are allowing too much authority and responsibility for our lives to become concentrated in Washington. If we had better and stronger government at lower levels, we would do much to reduce the risk that someday we're going to be governed by an entrenched and organized bureaucracy. And that was 1966. Another example, uh, Eisenhower calling for civility in politics and public life. And in other words, enough of the name calling and the demagoguery that seems to, to come, be part of the political scene. Eisenhower expressed it this way. He said, quote, except for moral issues and exact sciences, sciences, extreme positions are always wrong. And finally, in another letter to David, this time when he was in college and he and I were still dating, Eisenhower uh, wrote his grandson that he'd just gotten a missive from David's younger sister, Anne, who, quote, reports secretly that when you come to see her, it is usually for money. Remember that most Republicans are very seriously criticizing the administration Democrats for big spending. Republicans don't believe in financial deficits, end of quote. Sounds really familiar, doesn't it? And now I'm going to turn over the podium to David. He'll tell you a, a bit more about the book, Going Home to Glory, how parts of it were written here in Radnor. And I promise that everyone's going to get home in time to root the Phillies on to a big win tonight <laughs> against the Nationals. Thank you very much. Institution. What I found, uh, this was back in 1989, Pam and I were comparing notes 
uh, at the beginning of the night. Uh, when was the last time uh, I can recall uh, actually doing work at, at Bradner? I think it was in and around the time of the Clinton inaugural back in 1993. I can remember having a long discussion about it uh, with uh, uh, people in the library. But the thing about it is that the secondary sources uh, are very full. If you're looking for standard uh, sources, sources that you have to have uh, to write an historical work, uh, they're on file. And their uh, archival files were very good uh, as well. And it was an absolutely wonderful and delightful uh, place to work. And I'm also here tonight, uh, and Julie and I are here to present uh, this book. It is a pleasure to discuss a book which, as Julie indicated, is about several things. Uh, it is about a special time in my life. Uh, this is uh, essentially my story, though Julie uh, took a big hand in, in uh, uh, helping in, in uh, collaborating with this book. It's about uh, a family that made this time in my life uh, very special. It is about an adventure uh, that uh, I had in national politics and an adventure that Julie and I shared. It is a book about public service in a different time. Uh, I think that this is very topical today uh, as uh, Americans are now seeking to find common ground to meet challenges facing our country today, which I believe are as significant as any I've seen uh, in my lifetime. And this book is about a very prominent uh, public servant, and so it is about uh, the requirements of public life, I would say the sacrifices of public life, and the satisfactions of uh, public work. I'd also like to say that uh, uh, I researched portions uh, of the Radnor Library. Uh, in fact, what I had then was a uh, draft, I can say about half of it uh, in draft when I was working here. I have half of other books uh, that I developed at Radnor and will be uh, published in the future, hopefully. Uh, uh, this was, uh, I, I touched up uh, uh, many points while I was here thinking that someday I would want to put this story out, and I have always wanted to put this story out. Uh, going way back, uh, 35 years ago, Julie and I uh, first heard that there was interest uh, in us, uh, in the publishing world, and Julie and I uh, circulated book proposals. She was the first uh, to publish a book, in fact, uh, Special People in 1976. Uh, and as she did that, I was circulating a proposal, and the title of that proposal was Going Home to Glory. That was 35 years ago. Uh, and now, finally, circumstances uh, have converged, come together uh, to permit us to put this uh, book out. It is an unusual topic. Uh, this is not a study of presidential decision making. It is not a study of uh, uh, great events uh, in the Eisenhower years, but it is essentially a look at what follows the White House. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower would be a, uh, he was an elder statesman uh, to be sure, but he's reflecting back for the most part uh, on his years in power uh, and on its rewards uh, and its sacrifices. In recent years, I think we were encouraged to proceed with this project uh, by publication of two books that I think are very good, and you probably have them at the Rabbit Library. Uh, one is Douglas Brinkley's The Unfinished Presidency uh, about Jimmy Carter. This is a book that uh, takes as a, uh, a thesis uh, that the Carter presidency was interrupted, uh, that uh, Carter's uh, uh, I would say uh, <clears throat> thrust in, in public service uh, was always uh, somewhat larger uh, than uh, he could possibly fulfill uh, in a four-year four presidency. Uh, and so the unfinished presidency carries over into his post-presidency, which of course culminated with a Nobel Prize. It's, a very, it's the best book, I think, on Jimmy Carter. One of the best books on Teddy Roosevelt uh, is written by Candace Millar. It is called River of Doubt. And what this book is about is the way that Teddy Roosevelt, after the 1912 election, worked off his personal disappointment uh, for having lost that election by organizing an expedition to explore the uncharted regions of the Amazon basin in Central South America. This was a, uh, one of the most hazardous uh, undertakings that you could ever imagine. And he almost died in the process. I think he, uh, they measured his temperature at one point, uh, about 106, uh, for, for several hours. He contracted all kinds of fevers and uh, actually told his son to leave him behind at one point. This is a, uh, 
uh, one of the best books written about Teddy Roosevelt. Uh, and uh, I think that what they both tap is something that we saw an opportunity to do here, and that is uh, to be innovative about presidents. Uh, most books about presidents start with uh, birth, and we talk about uh, how leadership talents were developed. We talk about formative experiences, or what Solzhenitsyn called the decisive uh, moment for every life. Uh, and then we carry this on through the uh, story of a presidency, and then uh, typically the biographies end. Uh, or there is just a, a stop in the coda. Actually, if you want to know about a president and how they feel personally about an era, uh, I have to say the post-presidency has got to be one of the best uh, subjects there, there is. The president has already served, uh, which means that uh, he and someday there will be a she. I teach the presidency at the University of Pennsylvania, and I uh, always uh, issue that disclaimer at the beginning of class. <laughs> uh, but they are at a moment where they can share this experience and reflect back on it, uh, and they are inclined to do it. Uh, they are also much easier to know uh, than someone who is obscure and on the rise and we do not uh, recognize that uh, someone's going to become president or uh, as president surrounded by aides and, and driven by a schedule and so forth, which is very hard to control. Uh, these are people who are uh, accessible uh, in their stories uh, and are very interesting. And as Julie indicated, this is a story of particular significance for a country which today, under the operation of the 22nd Amendment, requires our chiefs of state to step down after two terms. And this imposes a limit on powerful and charismatic individuals who in many countries uh, would rule uh, indefinitely. We not only require them to step down, uh, we require them to be good at sports about it. In fact, you like it uh, and so on. And so this is a question about how they uh, learn to love uh, life uh, after the presidency. What this amendment does institutionalize uh, is our American notion that public service is a task, it is a responsibility, it is not a station, and the ultimate satisfaction in, in uh, public life is not what you gain, but essentially the satisfaction of uh, uh, feeling that you've done a job well, a job well done. Therefore, Going Home to Glory opens on January 20th, 1961 as a million or so people are thronging to Washington to see the inauguration of a new president. And that is the story everybody remembers about January 20th, 1961, but we are telling a different one. Uh, and that is of the motorcade, the former president uh, and his wife making their way north through the snows of suburban uh, Washington and up uh, Highway 15, uh, greeted by literally thousands of people uh, with uh, candles uh, and signs uh, welcoming Ike and Mamie back to their new life. I remember that night uh, very well. We were uh, at our home on the corner of the Eisner Farm uh, in Gettysburg. We had a family dinner that night. Uh, going home to Glory sort of opens with it. I can remember the toasts. In fact, I recalled them with my father the other day. He was still alive and well at 89 years old, and my recollections were, were quite accurate. Everybody sentimentally toasted the past, and they toasted the beginnings. Uh, of the new life which began for them on January 20th, 1961. Now in the months and years ahead, Dwight Eisenhower would not be leading us on an expedition down the river of doubt. Uh, though, as a president, he had occasion to doubt. Uh, Begin with the 1960 election. Uh, he left office in 1961 under no illusions. Uh, about what the narrow Republican defeat uh, in 1960 meant for his political legacy. Power was passing to the opposition party. Uh, presidents care about their legacy. They also care about uh, the ideas that they've set in motion. Uh, and they believe that their administrations have been good for the country. And so he was uh, concerned about the direction that the country was going to take. Nor was this uh, an unfinished presidency. Uh, in fact, it was the opposite. It was not an unfinished presidency, but I'll say something about that too conveying something my dad uh, told me um, at a time that I can't even remember. And my father is a very important source in this book. I think I probably learned more uh, from my father by growing up around him uh, than, um, uh, than anyone. He was uh, very close to his father. and He was somebody who uh, understood uh, public service uh, very carefully. And what he said to me once 
was that it is impossible uh, to have been a president of the United States, to have occupied a leadership position uh, of that magnitude, uh, and lead the office without regrets. Uh, <clears throat> presidents just simply are going to have regrets. They're going to have small regrets, and they're going to have large regrets. Uh, and Dwight Eisenhower experienced regrets, and we cover that uh, in this book. One regret was the political estrangement that he experienced from his one-time political and military colleagues in the Truman and Roosevelt administrations. Eisenhower uh, had served Franklin Roosevelt in the most, uh, I would say, confidential uh, spot of the entire war. He commanded the European theater. The European theater was the priority theater in World War II, and uh, uh, that placed Eisenhower in a position of uh, uh, great, great responsibility in the eyes of uh, uh, President Franklin Roosevelt. His relationship with Harry Truman in the 1940s, and we recount this, was actually fr a friendship. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower's diaries in this period leave no doubt uh, that he really enjoyed uh, Harry Truman. They had a lot in common. They were both uh, Midwesterners. Uh, Truman was from Kansas City, and, and Eisenhower was from Abilene, Kansas, and in fact, uh, uh, they got along the way you can imagine uh, two people in a yearbook from Abilene, Kansas. Here he is the fellow with kind of thick glasses who plays the piano, and I think he's president of the student council and takes uh, Harry under his wing, uh, and so forth, and they probably meshed as uh, great friends. Then Eisenhower emerges as a Republican in 1952 in the partisan uh, uh, Truman decided that he was going to campaign against Ike, and at one point, at the very height of the campaign, he erupted with the charge that Ike was a snolly gospel. <laughs> I'm not sure what smelling Oscar means, but uh, apparently in the Midwest, uh, smelling Oscar is a fighting word, uh, uh, something like that. When uh, I heard that he had been called a smelling Oscar, they never spoke again. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so this was a, uh, an estrangement. Incidentally, this also touches uh, probably one of his most important political legacies. Uh, in 1952, Dwight Eisenhower stepped out of this role of nonpartisan figure uh, and victorious general in World War II, somebody uh, in service to both parties, and decided to commit his prestige. And as my father reflected, uh, decided to run and that uh, suddenly he lost 40% of all of his friends. This was a, a significant sacrifice. He decided to run because he had become persuaded that uh, the Republican Party, which had lost five straight national elections, and without him in 1952 would have lost a sixth, and perhaps a seventh, and perhaps an eighth, that American democracy requires an effective opposition party. Uh, he was a Republican. This is uh, uh, a fact about him, but he would not have run for office except that uh, he had arrived at that conclusion. And I think that. Uh, uh, he, one of his most important legacies in the 1950s was to point a party which was an entrenched but diminishing opposition force, uh, wedded to trying to repeal uh, a lot of ideas that the American people had accepted as uh, correct, uh, into a party looking forward. And the Republican Party became a forward-looking party in the 1950s. And in fact, Eisenhower was not the anomaly uh, leaving the White House in 1961, as uh, many people seem to assume he was, he was in fact the first uh, of a line of Republican presidents that we have had since uh, uh, the 1950s. Uh, Republicans have, uh, for the most part, uh, uh, I won't say dominated elections, but they have won uh, over two-thirds of the presidential elections uh, since then. It's the beginning, uh, the dawn uh, of uh, a kind of Republican era. It's been a non, it's been a deal line here, but it's a sort of Republican era. This was uh, an finished presidency, not an unfinished presidency, is another way of putting it. Uh, he had doubts, but he also had great satisfactions. Uh, when I was around him in Gettysburg as a teenager, literally when he came home, I was 13. When he died, I was 21, exactly 21. Uh, his uh, funeral in Washington was my 21st birthday. Uh, we grew up as his neighbors. And uh, he could look back with great satisfaction on World War II and his role in it. He could look back on a presidency, which was uh, known even then, in the 1960s, as a period of peace and prosperity. Uh, it was a time of consolidation at home and reconstruction overseas. Uh, it, is, it was a time when America entered the space age, the computer age, the television age. We built an interstate system. 
uh, highway system in the 1950s. We built new suburbs uh, all across this country. We adapted to entirely new living, living patterns, and we began to accept new commitments uh, for social progress in this country, including civil rights. It was a very good time uh, in this country. But its principal focus, and this is what I enjoyed relating and really enjoyed uh, about the book as well, uh, is on Gettysburg. And in Gettysburg, Dwight Eisenhower, in the final analysis, was somebody who was focused on the present and the future. There he was citizen Eisenhower. And this book is a character sketch of a very remarkable person at a time in which I knew him best. Uh, I knew him as a former statesman, or as a statesman, elder statesman, as a former politician. Uh, he hosted a lot of Republican events uh, at the farm, uh, and I can remember those well. Uh, but I knew him uh, even better uh, as a farmer, hunter, painter, golfer, former ball player, sage, uh, companion, especially as he got older, uh, and uh, as a supervisor and a boss. In fact, he was the first person to ever hire me. Uh, my first job at age 10 uh, was to work on the farm. If you go 100 miles west of here and go to Gettysburg, please visit the farm. And if you do appreciate the fences, I painted them five times. It is at a rate of uh, 25 cents an hour. Uh, and so I, uh, uh, I earned my way, but I was not complaining. This was it's nice to have uh, quarters in my pocket. This was the family business. I was very good at it. I did have lapses. Uh, from time to time, and I narrate the, uh, the dire consequences of one of them. Uh, it was 15, summer of 1963. Uh, one of the farmhands and I were uh, playing honeymoon bridge over the lunch hour, and we decided to go for uh, an extra rubber, uh, thinking that the general was uh, back at his office downtown on Carlisle Street. Uh, had no idea he was uh, on the ground. Suddenly the door flies open. There he is. I don't remember hearing what he said particularly. I didn't see his mouth moving, and I made out the words, you are fired. <laughs> well, uh, we lived on the corner of the farm, and so I went home. Uh, after that, I sort of ducked into the house. I didn't want to answer any questions. Uh, and it turns out we had a golf date that afternoon, he and I. And this is where Roy Fairman comes in. Uh, we had a golf date that afternoon at the Gettysburg Country Club, and we went out uh, quite often. As Roy will recall in Eisenhower, uh, what, nine holes at the... Uh, Gettysburg CC was about an hour and 15 hour and 20 minute uh, affair. We flew fast. Uh, and uh, I wasn't sure whether he was going to show up or not. And uh, by, you know, 4 o'clock, the car pulled up, and there he was. Uh, and we uh, uh, rode in silence uh, to the country club. Uh, we teed off in silence. Uh, we played the first hole in silence. We played the second hole in silence. Finally, on the third hole, uh, which was a par three over water, or par five over water, long hole. Uh, after we got over the hill, I can remember Granite saying, uh, uh, David, I allow my associates one mistake a year. <laughs> <laughs> and you had yours. <laughs> and by the fourth hole, I had been rehired, proving that to err is human and to forgive divine. <laughs> I learned that he was a remarkable man. Uh, I got a sense of his remarkable rise, uh, what a remarkable person he was. Um, there was, uh, incidentally, um, uh, not a person uh, by the name of Dwight David Eisenhower I. Uh, Dwight David Eisenhower I was actually born David Dwight Eisenhower, and christened that way. Uh, he changed his first and second names, uh, his first name and his middle name, uh, the order of them when he registered at West Point in the fall of 1911 because he liked the sound of Dwight David better than David Dwight. He just switched his name and, and he was any of the wiser. Uh, as he registered at West Point, he listed Tyler, Texas, as his birthplace instead of Denison because it's better to be from town. <laughs> uh, and I'd like to say that uh, he was a uh, ball player in the Class B Central Campus League in 1909 and 1910 playing under an alias. Uh, because if he had admitted that, uh, West Point would have barred him from uh, playing football and he planned to play football at West Point. Now, whether that was true or not is something that we relate in the book. Uh, Red Patterson, who was a uh, baseball front office guy uh, for many years, he's the guy who invented the tape measure home run. Red Patterson was uh, uh, a very famous guy. He was working for the California Angels in the late 1970s. I went to a uh, ball game with Julie's dad and I wound up uh, uh, sitting with Red Patterson for most of the evening, and that was a lot of fun. And he told me a 
about a company, General Eisenhower, to a game uh, in New York Polo Grounds, he said, uh, in 1947-48, and he remembered taking the opportunity to ask the general about all of these rumors that were swirling in organized baseball that he had actually played uh, Class D ball in Kansas under the alias of Wilson. And uh, what Patterson said to uh, Eisenhower uh, was that uh, their record showed that there were two Wilsons in that league. Which one was he? And he said, the one that could hit it. <laughs> <laughs> so they confirmed it. And, uh, you know, if you go on a website, and I've just done this, if you go on a website, look at the Central Kansas League, 1909 and 1910, by gosh, there are two Wilsons in that league, and one of them plays first base for Abilene, Kansas, and he can hit it. <laughs> <laughs> this was not a political uh, <clears throat> experience, I would say, day and night. Uh, in fact, I was rather apolitical. Uh, Julie was apolitical when she was four years old and being interviewed by Jackie. Uh, when I went off to prep school in the fall of 1962, uh, I, I think I was a disappointment uh, for people who thought that uh, I would be some kind of standard bearer. Uh, I, I uh, attended debates uh, conscientiously and uh, so forth, but uh, I think I was kind of surprised. Uh, in fact, I, I'm a perfect foil for one of the greatest uh, uh, practical jokes I ever pulled off in Phillips Exeter Academy history, uh, and that was uh, my election to the only partisan political office I've ever held. In absentia and by acclamation, I was elected to Secretary Treasurer of Young Democrats, Phillips Exeter Academy. <laughs> uh, I thought it's kind of a ritual of acceptance. I, you know, they told me, and I said, "Geez, I'm one of the guys." And, uh, uh, isn't this wonderful and so on? And uh, somebody actually got it uh, placed in the newspapers, so, and so it was a story. My parents read about it and thought it was funny. Uh, my granddad didn't think it was funny at all. Uh, and so on. But uh, this was not a partisan. Uh, this is not a partisan account, particularly, though politics does figure in there. I would remain, I would say, somewhat apolitical. Uh, I was a citizen, and I was uh, becoming more interested in until I met my whiff, uh, that's Julie, uh, Ed Smith in the fall of 1966. And she's talked about uh, our first date and our second date and, and so forth. I found myself in, uh, uh, we were not only uh, a couple very, very quickly. I found myself, uh, and we found ourselves, uh, swept up in this great adventure of the 1968 campaign, which shed so much light on an aspect of my grandfather's. Uh, life that I had never really appreciated uh, fully, and that is how a national campaign works, and how the presidency works, and how leadership positions uh, in this country works, uh, and so forth, uh, in ways that I believe still definitely per pertain to national politics today. One of the things I learned in 1968, watching Richard Nixon deliver a uh, hundred or more campaign addresses, uh, and large, long ones and short ones, uh, and so on, uh, is the complexity uh, of a campaign, a complexity of the appeal, the care with which candidates fashion appeal, and what came out of it. What came out of it, essentially, was a mission-oriented presidency. I believe the presidency is a mission-oriented job. That is, if you're to understand any given presidency, this is a process that begins by attempting to identify the overriding issue or question that is decisive in an election that brings a presidential administration about. And it has this consequence. We talk about strong presidents, and we talk about uh, uh, less strong presidents or, or whatever. What is a strong president? Academics are arguing about this all the time. The presidency is actually on paper. Uh, at first glance, a very strong office, an entire article of the Constitution is dedicated to the presidency. At the second glance, you notice that all the powers are shared. The president is commander-in-chief, chief executive, diplomat-in-chief, legislator-in-chief, uh, chief of state, chief judge. Uh, when, and I think the Nixon presidency illustrates this, and certainly the Eisenhower, when a president is addressing the mission that accounts for a presidency coming into being, the presidency deploys a vast array of formal powers and informal powers, and they are very effective. When the question being faced is collateral to mission, uh, presidents exercise their powers in a ministerial way, uh, more or less in name only. Uh, this is proven by a irony. 
that I have seen played in the presidency. And the irony is, success in the presidency does not necessarily mean future effectiveness in the presidency. And this is where we come to this idea of unfinished presidency in Eisenhower. When a mission is fulfilled, the American people may feel gratitude toward the president, but the immediately relevant question becomes not rewarding a president, but defining the next overriding issue facing the country and identifying the next team to take it on. And this is a process in which a president has a voice, but often a feudal one. Uh, D D Dwight Eisenhower was elected in 1952 because he was a hero. Uh, and I got a sense of that uh, growing up around him in Gettysburg and going on trips with him. He was, of course, a hero. But more importantly, he was elected in 1952 because he had the capacity to organize a government that was responsive to the overriding crisis of 1952, and that was the threat of general war in Europe and the problem of a stalemate of war in Korea. Uh, he ran on a pledge of ending in Korea. Uh, I shall go to Korea. Going to Korea, not saying he didn't. And uh, <clears throat> so his presidency uh, is dedicated towards uh, uh, weaving a perilous path between appeasement uh, and war, uh, and forging a pause uh, in the Cold War, which uh, enables America to enjoy normalcy uh, and the world community to uh, breathe a sigh of relief uh, and to know some respite. Uh, from chronic uh, tensions, emergency, disaster, uh, catastrophe, going all the way back to 1929. Uh, by 1955, the Korean War was over. Uh, Indochina had been uh, negotiated. We had avoided war in Indochina without uh, surrender of principle or territory that we did not control, uh, that, that we did control. Uh, <clears throat> uh, a disarmament process was being revived. Uh, the American president and the Soviet premier are sitting down for the first time in 10 years after the ice, iciest phase uh, of the Cold War, and the American economy was suddenly beginning to prosper uh, in a brand new way. In 1956, a skeptical Republican Party renominates Eisenhower unanimously. He goes on to win a huge re-election, which puts a stamp of approval on a first term, which is a success by any yardstick one would apply in measuring success in the White House. It is a phenomenal success. But this is not the beginning of an Eisenhower era in the American presidency, strangely. It's the beginning of his problems. Because with success, with mission fulfilled in the Eisenhower presidency, as a post-war era comes to a close, gradually, and then rather dramatically, the spotlight begins to shift uh, to the questions that will dominate in the 1960s. And Dwight Eisenhower uh, <clears throat> thinks constructively about this. He tries to prepare the issue for his successor, and I think he did. Uh, issues such as civil rights uh, and other things that will um, concern us uh, in the 1960s uh, and so forth, but uh, his power begins to wane. Uh, the same dynamic happens in the Nixon presidency. It happens in all of the presidency is in the final analysis, a mission or a job. This is not some sort of perverse incentive to fail uh, or to put off for the resolution of issues. I would say this mission or a dynamic. Uh, the penalty, uh, there is a penalty worse than succeeding as president, as uh, failing. Uh, and uh, there have been times when uh, America has undergone uh, long stretches of uh, indecision uh, and so forth in our history. Uh, it is instead an incentive to think strategically, uh, to address pressing business, to understand that you are there to serve, and to understand that in the final analysis, uh, your real satisfaction is knowledge of a job well done. This is, a, uh, I think, underscored in Eisenhower's case. Just before this book opens, he gave the most famous speech of his presidency. It was his farewell address, uh, delivered 50 years ago, in which he warns the country against the, quote, unwarranted acquisition of influence by a military industrial complex. It's one of the most uh, famous speeches, probably the greatest farewell address ever given by an American president, and uh, ironically, the most uh, famous address that he delivered as president. I've done the research on that speech. I direct students uh, to the archives at the Eisenhower Library, and there's a brief story about it, which is quite illuminating. The drafting process began shortly after Election Day, and the first 13 drafts or so of 40 reflect the disappointment that the President felt about the outcome uh, of the election. Uh, it's a kind of warning against his success. 
Then somebody intervenes and tells the president, you can see this in the graphic, you can't do that. Uh, the job of an outgoing president is to make the next guy's job easier. And so you see all the qualifications, and they start to take it back, and you see all the arrows, and uh, uh, all the changes and so forth, and the, and the entire effort is sort of set aside after about 20 drafts, and then something entirely new begins. And that is, instead of looking forward, suddenly his perspective becomes timeless as he looks backward. Uh, on the 20th century, in his time of leadership, in the great riddle of the 20th century, and that is the juxtaposition of such phenomenal progress in the 20th century and such far-reaching tragedy. Uh, and this, the implications of this uh, for American democracy. At that moment, it became a retrospective and the greatest farewell any president had ever given. And I think that that reflected it in some sense his knowledge that uh, his presidency was in fact finished. Thereafter, he returns to private life and he will have an impact of a different kind. It will be no less important, and it will be on his uh, family. Uh, when this book came out uh, some months ago, uh, actually last year, and it's, it's out of paper back now, uh, uh, Julie and I uh, uh, had an uh, interview with the Philadelphia Inquirer, became a special uh, Philadelphia Inquirer author by Art, uh, uh, Art Carey, uh, and his wife Tanya, who are friends of ours. Uh, Art came over to our house, and when he came to our house, he came bearing uh, a bound, beautifully uh, bound book that he and his brothers and sisters had written about their grandfather. Uh, and this is full of photographs and illustrations uh, and beautiful text. And we spent that evening looking at Art's book uh, as much as talking about ours. And I recognized immediately that there was a connection. And when we went out on the circuit last fall, and presented this book, I ran into a number of people who had done the very same thing. The desire to acknowledge somebody who's made a huge difference in your life is overwhelming. And it is natural, a very natural thing, and we felt that need uh, as well. And so there is no effort in going home to glory to uh, change historical interpretations of the Eisenhower presidency as such. It is rather to expand the chronicle of his life and to cover another dimension when it was possible to know him well uh, to receive his advice, to appreciate his enthusiasms, uh, to work with him, to correspond with him in school, uh, to see the personal example of serenity uh, that he set uh, with his frank acceptance uh, of his limitations as time went on uh, and as his uh, health declined. Uh, and, and all of this was uh, seen through the prism of my teen years, and they were unforgettable. As my uncle Milton said, uh, he had a saying, and uh, we repeat it uh, in the book, and that is that the young are impatient to change the world. Those older, as we are, are determined to recapture the golden times of their youth. And these were definitely, uh, for us, uh, golden times when we were very fortunate. But I return in conclusion uh, to another point, and that is that it may seem strange that a nation uh, as powerful as ours uh, <clears throat> builds in uh, a kind of discontinuity in the presidency by imposing uh, constraints on leadership of the 22nd Amendment. But this is, again, an institutional mechanism which institutionalizes the principle that the ideas that America stands for are larger than any individual or organization. And I think that is uh, uh, the lesson that I took away from knowing about Eisenhower, a great public service, servant. And that is that public service uh, is service. It involves a great deal of sacrifice, much is required. But in the final analysis, there is the thrill of participating uh, in uh, our great experiment in self-government. Uh, and that is a thrill, and that is one that he uh, experienced, as well as uh, the quiet satisfaction of uh, being assured of a job well done. And that is what I took away from uh, him in this book and uh, the spirit that I want to convey about the uh, public service. Again, I want to thank uh, the Radnor Library for making their practically a carol uh, available for so long. Uh, I uh, really loved uh, coming here uh, and thinking through this uh, and other topics uh, that we will publish uh, in the future. And so in the future, we will be back to present uh, the next book uh, written at the Radnor Library. Thank you very much.
General Eisenhower, uh, there was there was a picture of yourself with a with a cap on, with a matching <laughs> a, a coat with a matching cap on. But the but the you could see the relationship and the love that was in the picture, and that was uh, it was a, it was really a classic thing of, of uh, you, you know grandfather and grandson it was just beautiful. Right. No, that, I, that's a wonderful picture, though. Yeah. They're in Fort Benning and Davis bowing to his grandmother. <laughs> that's the one you think he's referring to? Right. He has a little hat on and a little coat. Well, well it was a wonderful but, thing. But I have to say, it was very scarring, those clothes, because they were, you know, he was the grandson of the president, so he had to wear these little wool suits and these little wool coats and little wool hats. He won't wear any clothes now. I mean, he, 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 he kept getting shot, he won't, you know. It was he had to dress up in those itchy clothes, but I'm glad you liked doing that. Right. <laughs> yeah. The other thing I wanted to mention was I was out to uh, Gettysburg, and I would recommend anybody going out to Gettysburg, but I submerged myself there for four days, and, and part of the time I went out to the, the farm. And uh, what I 
what I really, uh, really took me back was his office, his office. When I, when I looked at his office, it kind of reflected, had to reflect him, uh, the, the, uh, the president, uh, in, uh, in the size of the room. I mean, it was, my, my office was only a little bit smaller than his office, but it looked like it was, it was kind of a walkthrough between uh, between the outside and into the interior of exactly. the house. And it's small, and it's spare, but very meaningful because the whole panorama of the Battle of Gettysburg uh, sort of uh, moved past it. Yeah. In fact, uh, one of the really wonderful passages of uh, his informal memoir at ease uh, is uh, about sitting in his office and uh, reciting and recalling, as he did when we had dinner with him uh, weekly. Uh, I, when we went to the, over the main residence for dinner, uh, usually on Friday nights or occasionally on Saturday nights, uh, these were seminars on the Civil War. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, what he saw reflected, of course, in the Civil War history was his own experience uh, as a commander in Europe uh, and, uh, <clears throat> and, and so on. But you put your finger on something that uh, you try to capture in a book. You know, I walked into, uh, I took, uh, my son and I went on a driving trip uh, in Canada uh, a number of years ago. Uh, it's been 15 now. Uh, and uh, our last point where we crossed the border was at Camp Abello, uh where Franklin Roosevelt uh, spent, uh, I think it's where he contracted polio, mm -hmm. and it's where he recovered from polio. And I was overwhelmed walking through that place because of exactly what you described, the furnishings, uh, all preserved, uh, which were furnishings that are familiar to me because, uh, because the White House and Camp David and all these places looked exactly like that in 1953 when I first saw them. It, it, it's simple, and I think uh, Julie would agree with this. This is, this is an era in the American presidency. It's austere. Uh, it's very meaningful. Uh, and uh, I don't say that that is the way people ought to be all the time, but uh, when, when we see that, I think it uh, kindles appreciation for what unusual people uh, did lead us uh, in that period. And that's exactly what I associate with it. I associate mental pictures, where they lived. Uh, well, I would just, just like to mention one other thing, if I could, is that uh, in, in the people that have passed by my particular, uh, my particular attention over the years. I can say that uh, General Eisenhower was the hero of my time. And uh, since I, ha I haven't seen anybody that could, uh, you know, illuminate my own thinking about leadership and wanting to be, do the right thing and like that. He was, he was certainly that kind of a person, you know, both, both in the way, in his actions, and uh, and certainly in his leadership. Well, it was a great era uh, as well, and that's something. You know. And when you said that, I, it was just I was thinking back to David's remarks this evening when he talked about the break between Truman and Eisenhower, and Truman was truly upset when I said, you know, made the decision that he was a Democrat, because of course the military they had, they did, couldn't you couldn't have a Blanco party if you were an officer. So no one knew if Eisenhower was a Democrat or Republican, but Truman was, that's why the breach was so severe, because Truman admired Eisenhower. I mean, they were close. Mm -hmm. And uh, even offered to run as Ike's vice president in 1948, uh, mm -hmm. as we talk about in the book. Well, it's an amazing era. And uh, one of our, uh, uh, I, I guess, uh, the real highlight of uh, 2011 for us is that, uh, uh, we were asked to lead an educational cruise to Normandy, uh, and we're going to be doing that twice uh, next May, uh, but we went this May, which about coincides with the uh, anniversary of the Overlord uh, operation. Uh, May, it was pledged in May, it happened in early June, but uh, so we're seeing it uh, sort of in real time uh, when it actually happened. And uh, you just think of the extraordinary feat. Uh, I think we're, I hope we're capable of it today, but if you think of what Americans did uh, in that period, that is uh, leaping two oceans uh, and taking on the greatest regional military powers uh, uh, of the day, not across rivers, but literally across oceans. Uh, and uh, the output, 
American factories. Uh, and the determination of American soldiers and the numbers of American soldiers and the scale of that, uh, that effort is just uh, awesome. That's something I would also recommend to uh, anybody. If you have an opportunity to uh, go to Northwest Europe, I strongly recommend uh, the Normandy area, uh, which is a very beautiful area. It's, it's sort of the place where Parisians go on weekends uh, because it's so uh, beautiful and desirable. But uh, its essential character has been kept, and it's a great crucible, it's a great testing ground like Gettysburg, and a very inspirational uh, place for all of us. Another question? Any golf stories that you might have? Yeah, well, Roy, uh, Roy would have some golf stories. Um, Roy and I, in fact, were talking on the way in, and uh, uh, we agreed that we were both uh, sort of uh, part, part of the group who was sort of uh, managing the general uh, when he was out there on the course. He had, uh, I think Roy will back me up on this, so he had uh, quite a temper, uh, and he was uh, a stickler for certain kinds of shots. Uh, he was somebody that believed in uh, uh, scoring shots. Uh, I learned a different kind of game, actually. Uh, I was taught golf when I was a kid. I had lessons from the age of five to about uh, 12, 13. I was trying to quit when uh, I was uh, seeing most of Roy and I had other ideas. Uh, but uh, the game I learned uh, can be summarized as follows. Uh, put yourself in my shoes at age 11. My job going out to this golf course is to tee off with the president and the other two people in the force in front of about 400 people on the first tee. Uh, and so my game was hitting the ball off the tee. That's what I like. Uh, because uh, that's what I had to be good at. Uh, what granted uh, insisted on were the scoring shots, the sand shots, uh, the putting, chipping, uh, uh, things like this. And I was, uh, I was not too smooth on that, and so I was uh, always uh, uh, felt a little bit of an edge. He was funny to watch, really. I want to add one little, little eye snap. He's in the World Golf Hall of Fame, by the way. Roy, did you know that? Uh, he's been uh, elected to the World Golf Hall of Fame. And also with the... Mm -hmm. President Eisenhower loved golf so much that he wore his golf cleats when he was in the Oval Office. And, um, you know, you, he would have visitors in all day, but if he greeted people from behind the desk, you couldn't tell he had on golf cleats. And you, the, the Rose Garden, outside the Rose Garden, he had a little putting green put in. And he would just, you know, dash out and putt for a few minutes between appointments. So when my father was inaugurated, the next morning after the inauguration, my mother had made the, by 9 o'clock, she's in the Oval Office, because the first job of the First Lady is to redecorate, so that, you know, the colors of the previous president, you know, you've got to put your stamp on it. And she was appalled because the entire floor was pitted from the desk to the, to the uh, Rose Garden. And it was, you know, so she said to my father, Dick, this floor, it's got to come up. We're going to get rid of it. You know, I had to put a new floor in. So my father was very sentimental. I mean, he hero worshipped Eisenhower. So he had all the, he had little pieces of the floor, all the cut up, and then he mount, had them mounted on little, um, trophy things and sent to all of Ike's golfing buddies and friends. <laughs> Very diplomatic way to do it. Yes, it was. <laughs> do we have one more question? I, I may have missed it, but is the Gettysburg Farm still in operation? Yes. Uh, and it's open to the public? Yeah, it's open to the public. Uh, was, uh, back in 1955, uh, I have to be stationed down at Fort Ritchie, Maryland. Right. And we set up communications between the underground Pentagon and, and uh, exactly. the in fact, that uh, Gettysburg is not far from uh, the Gettysburg Farm is not far from that entire complex. Yeah. Uh, Fort Ritchie, uh, which is where his uh, papers were stored after he left uh, office, uh, Camp David. Yeah. Uh, this is a place where the government was planning to go in the event of a disaster in the 1950s, and uh, my father was aware of all of that. Uh, uh, we weren't, but uh, <clears throat> yes, that's right. Uh, yeah, because he. he uh... I met him there twice while they had to practice a bomb in Washington. Yes. Everybody would come out for their team. Yeah, well, you know, that's uh, uh, when you uh, name those places, uh, that conjures up memories in my mind of uh, what we were passing through in the 1950s. Um, bomb, you know, shelters the bomb shelters. Bomb shelters. The uh, Hiroshima yes. was 10 years before uh, this uh, break in 1955. That's as close to. Uh, our time in grade school, when we're going through these uh, 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 air raid drills and so forth, as uh, let's see, 2011, let's say, minus, it's as close to us then as 9/11 is to us today. 9/11. Uh, now we're, we're going to be staying afterwards, so we'd be happy to answer any other questions afterwards, because I know people want to get into the game. Thank you. <laughs>
wonderful. Thank you all very much for coming on behalf of Radcliffe Memorial Library and the Radcliffe Historical Society. Thank you for coming. We have a great lineup this fall. We wanted the Eisenhower to just open up our fall season of authors and other fall programs. So I'll leave you out on the bridge. Uh, the Eisenhower will be out there signing books. Thank you and good night.